welcome to the Wonder Learn podcast. I'm your host, France Tapon. I'm here with my wife, Rejoice. Hi. <laughs> and Dirty Harry. Dirty Harry is this multi poo, a breed that I, of dog I never knew. You think it looks like a beach home frise, but anyway, uh, he's a 16 year old dog. He's got a sister, and somehow he's still alive, barely. He's blind, deaf, and uh, incontinent. <laughs> but anyway, that's it. Rejoice, how are you? I'm good. <laughs> you don't have the coronavirus? <laughs> no, not that I know of. Okay. Well, this is uh, this episode is going to be about the coronavirus. It's also going to be about, um, I also want to talk about hiking uh, during 2020, when everybody's, not everybody, but a lot of people are telling you not to hike. We're recording this on April 2nd, and just yesterday, I think it was, that we just passed an important milestone of 1 million cases of corona. Did you know that? No, I didn't. Okay. Yeah. 1 million cases. <clears throat> and how many people have died? That's another significant milestone. 60,000. 60,000. Wow. <laughs> yeah. And 60,000 is also another important number because that's exactly how many people die roughly every single day in the world. That's right. Somewhere on this planet, 60,000 people die. Now, coronavirus, it took about, what, two months or so, roughly? Two months. Maybe three months to get to 60,000. And the world, that happens every single day. I'm pointing that out because we just want to keep things in perspective, like how much of a big deal. Given the coverage, you would think it would be, it's quite deadly. Here's another number to consider. Roughly... 480,000 people, anywhere between a quarter million to 600,000 people die of the influenza every year. Again, that's a, a mighty big number, and you compare that to 60,000. The influenza is uh, far more deadly so far. An average influenza year is so, so far much more deadly. So sometimes a cure is worse than the disease. In other words, when we stop the economy completely, people are going to do what? They're going to lose jobs. They're going to feel depressed. They're going to maybe become homeless. All sorts of things. Maybe crime will go up. And another thing that might go up is suicides. So if you look at suicides, 800,000 people suicide uh, have suicides, you know, kill themselves every single year worldwide. 800,000 people kill. Now, during a corona pandemic or any pandemic that destroys millions of jobs and gets people on the brink of disaster, do you think that suicides will go up? I, I think, yes, it will go up because now people are at home. They don't go to work. Some people do work from home, but it's not the majority of people that do work from home on their computers. So uh, in the end, I think the suicide rate will go up. While we're trying to find a cure to coronavirus, we're also creating other problems. Right. And uh, on a personal level, we often like to take care of dogs. All of our dog business has dried up, even though we're taking care of one right now. Actually, we're not getting paid for this. We're just house-sitting for free. But some people might think that I'm e making some sort of equivalence between suicides or, and by the way, car accidents kill well over a million people a year. Tuberculosis mm -hmm. kills or about a million people every year as well. That's an infectious disease. Um, respiratory problems. Well, heart attacks is not contagious, but respiratory infections can be are contagious, and that's an example of a contagious thing. TB, tuberculosis, can also be contagious. Obviously, the flu can be contagious. Now, uh, uh, I I just think we are afraid of the coronavirus because we don't have a medicine for it. But if you compare the coronavirus to the flu to all the other causes of death of hundreds of people every year, the coronavirus seems like, yeah, it's just a coronavirus. But the 
What makes it so special right now is because we do not have a cure for it and we do not have a vaccine. We have a cure for flu, but that doesn't stop the flu from killing many people every year. It didn't, the vaccine doesn't, maybe it works for people who have the vaccine, but for us, like us in Africa, we don't have flu vaccine. I have never gone to the hospital or clinic every year to get a vaccination for flu or vaccination for tetanus or whatever. We don't get this type of things. But we're not afraid of all those things because when we get them, we will eventually go and get a medicine for it and cure it. But uh, corona is a special one now because we have no vaccine for it. But would it stop killing once we get the vaccine? Is, is going to go about doing its business like the flu is doing its business now. Right. I, I guess what I'm trying to communicate is that we put up with all sorts of death every day from contagious diseases, from non-contagious events. And as a society, if we really want to lower those deaths or certainly prevent a lot of those deaths, we could do it. We could dramatically reduce the amount of tuberculosis, respiratory uh, infections, um, we could re we could dramatically reduce uh, the amount of flu. We could just tell everybody just stay home, don't go outside. A lot of these infectious diseases regarding we could spend a ton, ton of money to stop suicides. Car accidents are killing over a million people a year. But as a society, we've just decided collectively like, well, we're doing as much as we can and that's enough. We don't want to screw with the economic system too much because the more effort we take, to prevent or minimize these problems, uh, the greater cost it's going to have on society. And at some point, you got to say, well, when is enough and is enough? And so far, I don't think we've hit that limit. But I think at some point, probably in the middle of this 2020, in the next couple of months, I think people will be saying, whoa, 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 wait, the cure is worse than the disease. What do you think? When do you think at, at what point is this going to people are going to say, all right, basta. I think very soon <laughs> because we, people can't just keep staying in the house like for months and months waiting for cure while their bank account, their job places is getting all close and, and many problems happening. I guess another issue that we can discuss is hiking. And a lot of people misunderstood me when I was suggesting just last week, hey, you should maybe consider going on the PCT this year. Well, the PCT has put out a very clear directive saying, no, we don't want anybody to be hiking on the PCT. Uh, when I was suggesting this last week, half of the, most of the PCT was still open. And I, I don't know if most of it's still open right now, but it's probably being uh, closed down. Here's where I think a lot of people misunderstand me. I think you should not hike your own hike in 2020. So don't hike your own hike in 2020. 2020 is the year that you should hike my own hike, not your own hike. <laughs> uh, in other words, do it a certain way. If you're going to hike the trail, don't just hike it like you always done it. You would have to take certain precautions. Number one, you want to avoid the major trails like the Appalachian Trail, the Pacific Crest Trail. Um, because first of all, the authorities have said that's illegal or, or at the very minimum, they're highly discouraging it. So if you're going to want to hike some trail, you probably have to look for alternate trails that are far less popular. Maybe the Florida trail. I don't know if that's open or closed. A friend of mine, Sim Blanchard, he, he just got off of it because he, though I guess all of Florida has a stay at home order. Um, and so those number of trails that are doable at this point are dwindling, at least in April of 2020. Maybe some of them will reopen in May. But so start off with just being legal. In other words, look around before you run off on any trail, try to follow the ones legal. But by the way, through hikers are notorious for constantly breaking the rules. Uh, and I'm guilty too, when they close a certain section of trail because of fires. I've gone through several of those places when I did the Continental Divide Trail and even on the Pacific Crest Trail, I went through these places, I don't recommend doing that. It's illegal, blah, blah, blah. But anyway, I, I know I'm not the only one who does that. So there will be some people who say, screw it. I know I'm not supposed to hike there. And who the hell is going to check it out anyway? Who the hell is going to be out there patrolling this uh, these trails? I don't think <laughs> there's going to be anybody, any rangers running around in the wilderness to find you. But, you know, take your chances. 
But the key thing is that if you want to be within the law, just look for trails that are, and there's plenty of trails that are, are, are open. There's BLM land, uh, Bureau of Land Management land, that is open. You can take your car out there. You can um, go there and then and hike, little day hikes, loops, and whatever you want to do, or go you know one week in, one week out, etc. cetera. Uh, this is a chance to, to do slow hiking. But here's the key point. Hiking itself is obviously not dangerous as far as contagiousness you're you're not just a meter and a half away from people you could be one and a half kilometers away from somebody you're very far away from everybody the so therefore the only risk and detriment or downside of hiking is when you do interact with people now on the trail you probably won't be meeting many people if you do obviously stay one and a half meters away from them if you do don't camp with them don't share food don't share your spoon don't get up close and all that stuff but that's common sense um but then that's also easy to do even if you guys are camping next to each other you could camp five meters away from each other quite easily you are going to be a vector for the transmission if you go there unprotected you could go there and if you don't have the virus you could have you could become a vector um of transmitting the virus by picking it up in the town and then taking it to another town, obviously. If you already have the virus and you're asymptomatic, you could also be a threat because you're carrying that virus into a town unknowingly. You feel fine, no major symptoms. You go there and you transmit it. Got it. Okay. But there's two simple ways of doing this. Number one, you could wear a bandana, right? Yeah. And yeah. you could wear what? A you know those goggles that people wear when they're swimming, like those Olympic swimmers? They're wearing those little goggles. You can wear that. Uh, those are very lightweight, and you can wear kind of a bandana. If you don't have a bandana, a, you know, take a, a T-shirt and, and wrap up so that you cover your nose and mouth. If you don't have a mask, you can make your own. It's not hard to make a mask. Now, is that an N95 mask? Okay, it's not an N95 mask. But a mask is better than no mask as all the uh, Asian, East Asian nations have proven in this pandemic, East Asians have a tendency to wear masks much more than any other society on earth. And they have been able to manage their transmission drastically. And those East Asians are not wearing N95 masks. They're just wearing simple masks, handmade masks, whatever. Uh, so any mask, it helps. N95 is important if you're gonna go to an orgy with a bunch of COVID-19 patients, then you probably should wear an N95 mask and maybe a few other things too. But if you're not, oh, there's, I guess you're waking up there, uh, Mr. Dirty Harry. Um, if you're not going to an orgy with a bunch of COVID-19 patients, then you should, you, you should be okay with just a simple mask. In other words, the N95 mask is useful when somebody's gonna sneeze right in your face right on top of you and by the way a simple mask might actually prevent that too but nine n95 is just bulletproof but most people on just walking to the store going into a store going into a post office don't need that level of protection a simple mask does a lot to stop you from transmitting it and from you getting it from somewhere else and that's the point it's a barrier and the same thing with what i would call trail hiking socks oh, sorry socks uh gloves so what you should do is have a pair of very lightweight gloves that you use when you go into town to do your shopping or to go to the post office. One of those activities, not both of them. You go there, wear those gloves, do all your activities in town. While you're in town, don't touch your face and all that kind of stuff. You're wearing your mask anyway, so you should not be touching much of your face. If you're wearing your goggles, you're not going to touch your eyes. So you just go around. You might look a bit strange, but that's okay. Everybody will understand why you're doing it. You go around, you do your shopping, you get out and then you take those gloves off as you're walking back onto the trail and then you put those gloves outside your backpack so they get some uv light uv light will help kill the virus but even if you don't even if you bury it in your backpack the virus won't last there for more than a few hours maximum a day or about a day or so it doesn't last on inanimate objects so that's another way to kind of protect yourself and you can have these simple gloves and you'll be fine. And you have your uh, mask and you have your goggles. All this thing, whether you have the virus or not, that doesn't matter. Either way, that creates a barrier between you and the rest of the world. And that stops you from being a vector 
for anything. And that's all that you need to do. That's your responsibility. That's stuff you should be doing at home. Some people have this idea of like, oh, hiking around your local home is okay. But going far away, getting in your car and driving a thousand kilometers is bad. Now, one last thing, you know, you shouldn't hitchhike. Hitchhiking is also a risky activity, but if you have to hitchhike, well then again, just cover yourself up and do all that stuff. The person who, will, who picks you up will probably be very grateful that you're wearing a mask and you're wearing goggles and you're wearing, uh, and you're, and you're wearing gloves. You might look like a serial murderer, but if they trust you, then they'll do it. Also, you could roll down your windows. There's a great um, animation that I saw the other day from these Japanese research scientists that filmed how um, when somebody sneezes, and, or somebody coughs, the 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 particulate matter rests in the air. All the little microscopic droplets rest in the air for several minutes. But if they'd opened a door or a window, whoosh, they disappear quite readily, quite quickly. So that's something to consider when you get into a car with other people. If you have to, or then roll down the window, and then all of a sudden, if somebody does cough or sneeze or whatever all that stuff gets pulled out away so those are all measures that you can take and hike uh, successfully especially if you don't hitchhike uh, you can get away with it and you just cover yourself up when you go into town and you should be fine don't stay in hotels in town don't uh, go you're gonna have to shower in the wilderness you know whatever you're gonna have to use a bucket shower you know toughen yourself up um, but I think it's a great time if you're willing to take those messages and not hike your own hike, but hike this particular hike, then you can get away with it. What do you think? Well, I just think with, if you're very careful, you will be fine. And the people that you meet or the grocery stores that you go to sh do your shopping while on a trail, they will be fine. It's just common sense. You have to you protect yourself. You do your best and things will be fine. Would you would you want to go to on, on a hike? I would go if it is uh, if there's a trail open and that it is legal. I don't like doing things illegally, uh, so I would avoid. If a park is closed, I will not sneak into it to hike. But if a trail is open, it's legal. I'm gonna go on it and just be careful. There was a funny thing that w my brother and I, my brother turned. Uh, well, anyway, he had a birthday in uh, March 10th, uh, March 27th, and he had a virtual birthday party. So everybody got on Zoom. He had like 70 people show up during his two-hour party. And several of the, my brother's a doctor, and several of the people there were also physicians. And I asked them, I said, hey, how many people do you think are going to die worldwide from this virus? And one guy said, uh, I took the first guess. I said 1.5 million people are going to die worldwide. Rejoice, you said? I said a million. And what did the other people say? Uh, I don't remember, but one of them, I think, said it's uh, about 250 or yeah. something. One guy said 200,000. Another said, I think, 150. One said 200,000. Anyway, I was like, I was the worst, you know, guy. I mean, I was, in other words, I had the, the worst prediction of all. In other words, the, the most loss of life, 1.5 million. Which, by the way, I, I picked that number because I said, well, that's roughly three times worse than, an, than, a, than a flu season. Again, don't get all over me saying, it's not the flu. You know, the coronavirus is not the flu. It's a different thing. I, okay, yes, I understand. But I'm using it as a, as a point to say that we as a global society put up with roughly half a million deaths from the flu every year, year in, year out, all the time. And we deal with it and we're just like it sucks that that's bad news but hey we just go life goes on and so i just thought okay well if it's triple that that would be bad uh, other people have pointed out the fact that the the hospitals will get overburdened and that will create other problems and which is true if the hospitals are getting flooded with these corona patients a surge of them then people who have other issues won't have attention and medical attention so therefore they'll be cascading uh, deaths which is true anyway i I just thought it was interesting that so far this is not happening. We yeah, so have, far yeah. we don't have overflowing hospital well, anywhere we, in uh, in the America. That's not true. They, there, really? there are there are hospitals now that are setting up like uh, units outside. There, I don't know if they're taking over like stadiums or 
they're converting uh, convention centers into like makeshift hospitals, mm -hmm. that kind of stuff. So in, in many ways, that there is an overflow. Certainly, there is in Italy. That's for sure. Um, so it's a, it's a, it's a, it is a risk, and it is happening to some extent. It's certainly getting taxed quite a bit. I just, I, I just think coronavirus is over. What do you say? Exaggerated. Yeah, exaggerated. It's, it's exaggerated. Even after the vaccine will come, then we will now think coronavirus is the casual thing, like the flu. Then corona is still going to be around, but because it has a vaccine, even if it keep killing uh, 400,000 people annually, then it's not going to be a problem. But because now we have no vaccine and it has killed about 60,000 people, then now it's a problem. But when you look at the numbers of how many the flu kill every year and how many corona have killed in two months, it's not uh, it's not big of a problem. It's a problem, but it's not like, oh my goodness, it doesn't, for me, in my opinion, it doesn't warrant all the the problems, the news, the the the, the all this stressing is not worth it. But I'm not saying that Corona should be around and that uh, we shouldn't be worried about it. We should be. We should be worried about the flu. We should be worried about malaria, everything. They should completely disappear. But they haven't disappeared. They're around, but we find a way around it. So we would find a way around Corona as well. I think also it's important to note that Part of the reason why coronavirus only has 60,000 deaths is the fact that we've taken such drastic measures as a, as a global society. It's really impressive. To me, I'm just stunned because I'm like, wow, I would not have predicted that the global society would do such a coordinated effort to sh shut down the economy for a month or maybe two or three or who knows how many before finally there's going to be a revolt in the streets and people are going to say screw this who cares if a bunch of people are dying i need to work i need bread i need food i need shelter i need to pay for my bills you know it's going to hit that level where at some point people are just going to throw their hands up but by the way as far as the vaccine i think that uh, from my understanding coronavirus is different than an influenza virus uh it might take a minimum of a year to get any kind of vaccine or uh, cure but then what do we do while we wait we're going to stay in the house for one year well that's the point that's what i'm trying to get at is that <laughs> at some point that's not going to be like <laughs> right and that's the thing is that it's going to die down but then of course it's at some point they're going to say okay let's all go out and then we're going to reinfect each other because there's going to come usually this comes in a second wave it's going to be an issue so Maybe maybe they will produce enough uh, the mask M ninety yeah M ninety four or what is this what is the N N ninety five N ninety five maybe they will produce enough and give every individual one there I you don't go. know yeah, yeah yeah but but people have to go out at a certain time they can't just lock people in the house like for uh, this is April May June July oh, oh boy it's a long time to next year. I, I just can't time. imagine how <laughs> Africans are dealing with this. Because <laughs> Africans are the most social people on earth. My, they are hyper-connected. Their, their families, everybody lives on top of each other. I, anyway, I cannot speak for all Africans, but my brother is in Yaoundé, <laughs> and I have family in Garwa and Marwa. This I is in Cameroon. Some, yeah, in Cameroon. I have some friends in Nigeria. My brother said in the morning, everybody goes out and do... Children don't go to school, uh, already this is good but people go to the market ones who sell vegetable they sell vegetable the regular market market time some people who have masks they put and women who have hair scarf they just put it around their nose not even everybody just a fraction very few try to cover their faces and whatever everything is normal you don't see people disinfecting the chair disinfecting the car or the taxi nothing and then but the bar where people go to take the drinks and drink alcohol and h hang out in the evening all the bars are closed the d for during the day and also the evening if you want to drink alcohol and socialize you socialize with the people in your house you buy your bottles you sit down at home and you drink but you just don't go outside and socialize so everything goes normal but schools are closed uh, the restaurants are there and uh, the markets are there, but the bars are closed. 
this is going to have a devastating effect on Africa for many ways because Africans often live, most Africans, I would say, are, live on a, a very thin margin. In other words, they, they have just a few dollars in their pocket. Their savings is minimal. They're, right? <laughs> and, but people don't have always money like or food the, or food coronavirus is here now i'm going to go stock up on food for the next uh, two weeks or three weeks or a month most people there are some people in africa who have the money to run to the supermarket or to the local market and buy food that lasts a month or two or even more but majority of us in Africa, people don't have that money, so they have to go. It's a daily thing. The wife goes to the market and the man goes to the construction site or whatever they do, or driving motorcycle, if the man is even walking and not just sitting with his friend and playing card game or whatever it is that men do. The woman will go sell her mangoes, oil, groundnut, rice, and then in the evening she will buy what the family is supposed to eat and come back home and cook it. And everybody will eat that. The leftover will be eaten the next morning. And then she or he have to again go out uh, the next day to find what the family will eat again in the evening. So people have to go out and walk. It's, you cannot just tell people, oh, no, you cannot go out. You have to stay in the house. Then there will be no food in the house. They don't have a, when I was in Yaoundé, I used to live with my uncle. Our fridge has the only thing you will ever find in our fridge. There is me, my uncle, his daughter, one of my cousin. There's four of us in the house. The only thing you will ever find in our fridge every day when you open it, it's a big fridge, is a bottle of water. We, we have those sauce tangy, we call it sauce tangy. The mineral water is drunk maybe three months ago, somebody bought it, and then we find the bottle maybe in one of those bars. You bring it home and you pour the tap water inside the bottle, and then you store the water in the fridge to make it cold so that whenever you want to drink cold water, there is cold water in the fridge. That is basically what you will ever find in our fridge. My uncle is a teacher. He is the moderate people in the society. He's not poor, but he's not also rich, so he's in the middle. But we never have like bread or egg or cheese. Cheese, you see, I have only seen cheese a couple of times in my life. Uh, as a 23 years, I married when I was 23. But I have seen cheese a couple of times. I can count the numbers of time I have eaten cheese. So you just don't stock your fridge with food and food and then they go bad and you throw it away and you run to the supermarket, you buy. I, I just think people here, they have a lot and we would all survive. It's not going to be the apocalypse where there is no food. So we should be grateful and enjoy. This might be a good time also to mention that from an investment perspective, a lot of people wonder like how I live. A lot of times I make investments and I had thought that there was going to be a market pullback for the stock market for a long time just because we had had the longest bull market in history, like, I don't know, something like 11, 12 years. And so I thought, okay, well, we've hasn't been so, it's been great ever since 2009 that I didn't know what was going to stop the, the market but it ended up being the coronavirus. I was all in cash, almost all in cash, like 80, 90% cash. And so now is a great time, I think, to get into the stock market. Here's a particular stock tip. There's a ETF, an exchange traded fund. It's called JETS, G-J-E-T-S, JETS. And it covers the travel industry, especially the airlines and a little bit on the hotel side too. And it's been decimated. It went from $35 a share down to $5 a share. That's a tremendous drop. But I think at some point, the airline industry will come back. It's a short-term play. It's In other words, I think it's a play that you could have for in the next year or so. That's what I call short-term. Um, I, I don't like airlines as a long-term investment. But right now, after having them battered, and they might still go down a bit further, but I don't think airlines are going to disappear from the face of the earth. I think they will eventually come back. And when they do, they'll come back in a, in a big way and they'll be able to recover and do well. So that's a nice ETF to, to capture a little bit of that. And the other one is Bitcoin. Bitcoin has, has also had a pullback. It's now around six to $7,000 range. 
uh, and it went as low as like just under 4,000, but it's a great time. I made a prediction that it, it was going to hit around 10,000 at the uh, above 10,000 at the end of this year. So you're getting it roughly what I think is half price, but we'll see. I could be wrong. Um, but regardless, I think the, the market, it's a great time to invest right now if you're looking to, uh, if, you, if you're lucky to have cash on hand. Um, to invest, this is this is the perfect time. I just think that Africa is, it would really suffer uh, because, like you said, that the, the, that the bars are now closing. They are closed. Just think about all the, the people who work at those bars. They need food. They need. They have ten children. They have whatever, at least three or four, and they got to feed them. And and it's just the society on and in most African sizes. Well, yeah, it's already. My my brother told me a very funny story. <laughs> <laughs> okay, in Africa, people just say things that for us is funny, uh, but when people say it here, when uh, you uh, Americans and white people will get offended and say that, oh no, you cannot say that. But anyway, my brother and I can't say that, and we do talk about it. <laughs> he says, like, women are getting desperate <laughs> whenever they see somebody, a man who seem to show sign of wealth, <laughs> they will do whatever they can to get him. <laughs> he says there is one woman, one of his neighbors, she has two children and she used to have a husband and they separated and then suddenly she started coming over to his house and hanging out. To your brother's house? Yeah, to my brother's house. And oh. then uh, three days ago in the night around 11, she knocked his door and then he, he saw her, he said, what's going on? She said, ah, can I come in? And he said, um, it's, it's in the night, I'm really tired, I gotta go to sleep. He said, any problem? She said, well, I have always uh, been in love with you. you know? <laughs> <laughs> she has two children, my brother is How old is she? <laughs> Probably older than me. <laughs> she already oh, really? has two children. And then Mustafa is uh, <laughs> like, no, you're older than my sister. Do you, do you know how old I am? I don't like you. He's I 25. Don't, yeah, I don't want you. And then the next day she went to the next door neighbor, <laughs> which is a friend of my brother. And she knocked at his door. The man let her in. She had her beer. And then she tried to seduce him. And then the man told her, hey, madam, leave. And then in the next morning he went and met my brother. He told, can you imagine this, our neighbor? My brother said, what happened? She came to my house and she's trying to seduce me even though she knows I'm married. I showed her my wedding ring. I told her to get out and never come to my house. This woman, <laughs> they're trying to find a man that has a little bit of money by all means. I guess Yaounde is hot now. Hot means like there is a lot of poverty and unemployment and there is no money. So women are trying to do whatever they can to get money and feed their children and their family. It's funny for us. We were laughing about it, but you guys might not find it funny, but we do. <laughs> and by the way, it's something that's implicit, but it may not be obvious to people who are just listening to this. I would say, I don't know if it's fair to say most African, 50% or more African women, uh, at, at some point in their life, they basically expect money for sex. Hmm? Expect money for sex? Yeah, well, um, let's say you have a girlfriend. It's your girlfriend. She comes to your house. You have a nice time together. When it's time for the girl to go back to her house or her family house, it is expected that you would remove money from your pocket and give it to her to pay the transportation back. And because they say this transportation, you don't give her only, if the taxi money costs 250 CFA of our money, you don't give her only that 250. You give her more than that. Like you give her like 2,000 safer or 3,000 or even more so that she would pay the taxi and then she would have a lot more left to do whatever it is that women do, buy or whatever. It is like the, the, the normal thing for a guy to do. But a guy will not come to my house in Yaoundé and then when he's leaving and then I will take money and give to him. No, women don't do that. But when a girl visit your house and you must, you have to. If you don't, she's not going to come back again. And and it's just like not even hard of that. A girl come to visit you and then she leaves and you didn't pay her transport plus give extra. So I don't know if you call that they expect 
money for sex or whatever, but it's just the culture. Um, but what else? Yeah, but it, but it's something that I experienced at, in Africa when I would meet women. Uh, actually, <laughs> whether I had sex with them or not, they would they would ask money for me, and I thought, oh, it's because I'm a white guy and I'm the foreigner, I'm the rich guy. <laughs> yeah. But it's not true, right? Yeah, it's everybody. A man, if you're a man, just expect to always give to the lady. Uh, whereas I think here it's very different. If your girlfriend comes to your house or whatever, and she is leaving, you don't like. You so can. Here's you ten can, bucks. You can. <laughs> here's here, twenty bucks. Here, I think you can call the Uber on your phone and put the direction of your girlfriend's house if you want to do it. It's nice, gentleman thing to do. But if you don't call the Uber, you're not going to just remove your wallet and say, "Here's twenty dollars or fifty dollars. Pay your taxi." I think you'll get a slap. <laughs> <laughs> but over there, if you don't do that, I you'll think you'll get a slap for <laughs> not doing that. So it's just very funny here. Yes. Everything. <laughs> this difference. So here you give the money to the lady. You can do gestures, call the taxi, buy a perfume, a necklace, and give. But over there, if you don't give the money and buy the necklace and buy the perfume, you'll get a slap for that. <laughs> and that's your lesson for this Corona week of during the Corona apocalypse. So anyway, stay safe, enjoy yourselves, and uh, until next podcast. This is France Tapon with WanderLearn.com and Rejoice Tapon. Thank you. And also Dirty Harry. <laughs>